I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for the final speech, Looking Towards the Future, Mika Falou. Mika is Professor of Comparative Politics and Inequality Issues at Radboud University in the Netherlands in the Netherlands, a non-residential permanent fellow at the IWM, Institute for Human Rights Sciences in Vienna. She has extensive publications on gender equality policymaking in Europe, on gender mainstreaming and on intersectionality. Part of her current work is on the complex relationship between democracy and gender plus equality. She has also worked on understanding gender regimes and on gendered body politics. She is also a member of the Resistory Advisory Board, whom we would like to thank for bringing in external expertise and insight on the, the project's development. And in this last keynote, we've given her the, the task <laughs> of harnessing what we've learned to discuss in the panels and to transfer this to society, to civil society perspective, to look forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having been given the chance to be part of Resistre. And also thank you very much for uh, this mission impossible to, uh, to speak at the end of the conference uh, where all my uh, reflections on what I heard uh, today and yesterday are necessarily very fresh and sketchy. But then sketchy can be very nice. We see that on that side as well. And uh, it also means that it's not detailed enough for me to own it, so run away with it if you can. I'm going to throw another Mission Impossible back at you. So that's my goal because I think you're up to the task. Um, a little bit about my background uh, first, uh, because for the last decade, uh, together with others, some of them here in the room, uh, some may be online. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I've tried to better understand opposition to gender plus equality in Europe. It's not fun to study this, but it is necessary. And for myself, it makes it easier to keep going in the face of so much growing evil. What did I observe in this last decade in Europe? Unfortunately, I observed that while well, opposition to gender plus equality was to a large extent a matter of direct and indirect reaction to successful feminist mobilizing in the past, to feminist envisioning and setting in motion of new and better politics and policies to make steps forward towards feminist social justice, we can see now growing coalitions of actors that are proactively uh, restoring or attempting to patriarchy in its full uh, ugliness. As always, gender never comes alone, also not in their plans. So their mobilizing, visioning, and setting in motion towards is towards a patriarchal, xenophobic, racist, homophobic, transphobic uh, society that might do some lip service to class justice, but is comfortably sitting um, and uh, thriving within capitalism. And then, of course, always such larger visions and actions do not sit well within democracy. In complex ways, what I describe above is exacerbating the weaknesses and flaws that European democracies already have and have had for a long time. So to calm my nerves, and maybe also yours, in the face of such substantial uh, societal and political trouble, I'm lucky to coordinate now the Kindle project. You write it with a double C from co-creation. It's at the website uh, um, kindle.org, where you can find um, what we will uh, start, what we just started doing since October in seven countries and at the European level. Um, we study feminist movement responses and feminist institutional responses to these uh, processes. And we, we will co-create with feminist actors 
uh, better responses to all this. So you can see that the co-creation is what we have in common with the resistory project. So this is my introduction and like to show you what is the background of how I listen and read what you're doing. Now you know from what perspective I look at, um, at this tremendously impressive work that you have done together. Many of you already know that I am a huge fan of this project. So let me also tell you why, because maybe I didn't do that. So for those of you who were there yesterday, um, I noticed that even some of the researchers in this project are still in awe of what they have achieved. This is so wonderful to see. Now, people do things that exceed their own expectations, especially younger people that I know have always high ambitions. So um, imagine just three years of research and a mind blowing data collection with hundreds of politics analyzed, hundreds of civil society initiatives looked at, hundreds of experts interviews, hundreds of rapid assessment surveys, almost 800, it's mind blowing, narrative interviews, um, dozens of workshops, piles of reports produced, 21 fact sheets that I have managed to read, <laughs> all of them with policy recommendations, uh, enough, to make your head spin. But more importantly, enough to analyze. And some of this analysis has already been done also. It's not that this sheer magnitude only of good work done that I admire though. What I admire most in this incredible, is the incredible design of this project and how this design has been implemented in a collaborative team effort and filled with very promising theoretical thinking. Isn't that like too much for one project? Like, could you like? So let me uh, elaborate uh, a bit on this. I have to go back and forth in my notes, right? Because I was reading it on the spot. So what is this, what I admire in the project? So first of all, it's firmly rooted in democracy as an essential institution to guide also research. I think this is a very, very underlooked facet. Democracy is meant to be there in society, it's surely meant to be there in politics. But when it comes to research, hardly, it's a very small number of researchers that think that their research should be democratic also. Uh, but this is what this project shows that it can be uh, democratic, that it can have formats that bring democracy into a research project and improve the research project in doing so. So I, I think this is, this is the most important uh, element uh, in the project that I admire. Then also in these evil times, it focuses on hope, on promising practices, on a firm belief in the ability of people to care about social justice in their society and contribute to it. Because we should not forget that there's many of such people too. It's also quite unique in its understanding of the pandemic and its political and social responses to it as one complex crisis phenomenon, a dynamic complex uh, crisis phenomenon. I'll come back to that too. And because of its choice to tell stories, better stories, enabling um, a much easier transfer of its acquired knowledge to all of society, even if Mr. Debout didn't know exactly how that could work, he mentioned that it, it was helpful, it was helpful. So I think I had a number five, did I? I don't know, maybe I forgot something. Uh, I go back to number two. So from this strong combination of positive features of resistere, it's not hard to expand into follow-up ideas that are closely linked to it. I will give you some examples of what I can imagine, adding no doubt to ideas that you already have. So because I'm here, I can put my wish list there, and if you run away with it, I will applaud. 
So these ideas follow up on the range of countries looked at, the democratic formats used in the design of the projects, the still a bit sketchy reference to social complexity theory and to the study of the social world as dynamic and systematic, as well as to the reflection on what the results mean in the face of growing anti-gender and anti-democratic uh, campaigns in uh, Europe, whose democracies are shrinking and falling apart altogether. So what would I like to see? Um, I would like to see, uh, let's start with the simpler things, right? I would like to see a comparison between countries based on a typology of their COVID responses and um, one based on whether there is differences between the EU and the non-EU countries in the sample uh, that you have, which is a quite unique feature of the project uh, as well. And it would make my comparative politics hard, so happy. And believe me, that's also a very large subdiscipline that is in need of further, you know, I don't know, learning or something. Um, it would be very useful also to know that, uh, because as uh, Anode Boer has also said, the, the need for more contextual knowledge about member states is also very high at the level of, of uh, the European Union. Then I would also like to see if you find evidence in your data of uh, COVID with its policies as having generated a collective trauma across Europe. This is more a personal thing that I am a bit astonished at the speed in which everyone seems to have forgotten about this crisis. And social psychology tells us this is a sign of trauma. This is what happens after trauma. You want to get over it. You want to forget it. You, you pretend it wasn't there. Now, societies deal very badly with collective trauma. So it's better to see whether there is than, than to be surprised uh, in years ahead of us. Of course, I would also like to see the social complexity theoretical foundation of Resistere, which is very uh, visible in recommendation 18 on crisis as a continuum, to be elaborated more, including on this theory itself and where it might be in need of amendment or improvement. And I'm looking at Sophia, no, because she could do that. No, <laughs> with other people, of course. Um, then in these dynamics of inequalities is where social complexity theory, of course, is most helpful. Resistory already shows how there are feedback loops in there where, where feedback loops can explain that something suddenly seems to go very quickly or something suddenly ends. So I, I think it would be good to, to use the incredible data of these projects to look into this because it, it would increase our knowledge of societies tremendously. Um, and then I would also like to see, but I don't know where that would happen, um, on what kind of crisis COVID was or is compared to other crises. I mentioned this democracy crisis that we have um, there is, of course, a zillion of, as some people mentioned, that there is a cascade of crises um, compared to other crises. So I think it's not the same as this democracy crisis. There were no evil forces trying to push in a certain direction. It was something that, to a certain extent, was happening to everyone and everyone had to respond. The democracy crisis definitely has actors pushing against democracy. It's a very different kind of uh, crisis. So I, I think this is my, no. Then I also maybe, because there was so much talk about money in the previous panel, which I liked a lot. Um, I think Resist team should get funding at the very minimum <laughs> to make a detailed, Dry book, what is dry book in English? Uh, it's like, well, you, you know, what, script about the method they developed and how to do that. And I'll come back to that in a second. 
because now is the time when you as a team remember all the details of this. This cannot be done in two years from now. You will have forgotten because you have put, I've seen that as a member of the advisory board, you have put so much energy into the details of every step. And that's also why it has been successful. That's why it has to be, you know, reserved for future, uh, um, I don't know, for future use. And this was all the introduction to my final page, because now I come to the, to the key message uh, of my talk here. The key message is just five words. And these five words are, it should not be ending here. It should not. I think this is a project that shows not just the potential of this particular group of people, but the potential of social sciences altogether. And it should have the chance to show that an impact on social science research policy. So let me explain um, what I mean by that. And I, I mentioned this because it has been a mission impossible, this project. Nobody in their right mind would write up a research design like that if they had a chance to think about it one hour longer than they actually had. But then this incredible team has actually also done it. So, so if any people in the world, then this, these people should be able uh, to do that. So what... Um, so with this team, I think I can dream. And what is my dream then? So what, what we, would be my dream to trigger your dreams and then those of others with actual power to make stuff happen. So what the project showed, I think, is that rigorous democratic research is possible and that it produces results that are better fit to deal with our highly complex and unequal societies that are in a continuous state of crisis. Sorry, you were hoping for the end of it? I don't think so. It's also showed some gaps in the research data, of course, but it showed more than that. So what am I calling for? I'm calling for the European Commission for DJ Research, and we will tell them, you know, uh, to acknowledge that there are serious shortcomings in their current research and innovation programs in the social sciences. There is no space in there for blue sky team-based democratic research. It's not there. There is blue sky research options in the ERC. It's not team-based, it's not democratic. It, it's firmly sitting within this individual meritocracy idea that we know is also harmful to societies in many ways. So I think you, those blue sky means high risk, high gain, not thematically restricted uh, coming out of the field. And that's also why I think this script is so necessary because without that, you know, because the script, of course, needs to be improved. But I think this is a very good starting point for it. So this is, this is my simple dream. No? Um, it's, uh, it should be done. It's a mission impossible, but other mission impossible have happened in the past uh, also. If only enough people push for it. So there are already some people here in the room that can help the pushing for it. Uh, Europe is a, a very bad place for coming to decisions quickly, we all know that. But um, if you have enough people from different member states in the room, then there can be a simultaneous pushing on different levels. And if you have people from different parts of the European institutions, that can help also, right? So I think we need enough people to push. We need enough wise people up there in positions of power about research and innovation policies that are willing to jump in and create that space. We, we need people in and around the European Parliament uh, to help push for it because in Europe, rarely anything 
really nice happens without the European Parliament pushing for it. Um, and maybe um, also some transformative funders can steal this idea. Uh, I know that um, Resistory is making, uh, has a whole recommendation on transformative funding, so they can maybe plug this idea also towards uh, that, but not for Europe to, to think that they will wait for these people to do something first, no? Not, that's not the spirit of that. So that being said, I think um, that's all I wanted to say. And there is work to be done. I'm, I'm fully willing to, to contribute to a short, no? Policymakers need short, luckily, short papers to like a two pager on why we need blue sky team based democratic social science research uh, in Europe and why we need specific funding for that and how we can overcome some of the deadlocks within the DG research uh, also while doing that. And uh, then if you all help push for it, I'm sure um, something can happen. I only hope, because I've been around for a couple of decades, no, you can see that. And um, I happened to be at the European Commission in the 90s uh, when they started wondering um, how they could win the competition with the Council of Europe who had published this report on gender mainstreaming. And uh, this is in the competition between institutions. So that's like three decades ago. And what did I hear in the previous panel? We don't have a lack of gender mainstreaming tools. We really don't. We really don't. We have all of, all of them. But 30 years is really a long time. No, it's a generation. So I hope uh, that there are enough younger people in the commission that are as astonished as I am that it takes a generation and still they're not there. So. That's it. I wish you all again a lot of uh, pleasure in finishing this project. I wish you a period of rest that truly will not be funded uh, <laughs> after that. I don't know how we will do that, uh, but I've never seen any recognition that after research you will need rest or something, which is kind of obvious also, but then maybe nobody has ever said it before. Um, so let me say this. And uh, then by all means, let's all go on in many different places to make uh, Europe a better society. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mika. We really value your input here and your presence here. Let's keep dreaming and let's keep pushing. Resistory will be ending end of September. Until then, uh, we will have, we, so we will keep presenting our outputs through two webinars. So stay tuned to, uh, to our project to find out what's going on. We'll have an, we hope to help, uh, hold an, an event on transformative funding. And we'll also be joining an event on the 7th of September here in Brussels with the sister projects organized by Respond Project on health and policy responses to the pandemic. Other than that, keep pushing. And I hope you've had time to think about the fact sheets and the recommendations that you would like to share with your stakeholders on the way back, in the train, on the plane. <laughs> Take your time to do it and to and to do it now. We remember that time is important in crisis responses. Let's use our time efficiently. And remember that sometimes a small action can have uh, a large impact. I'd like to thank you all for attending these two days. Thank you all to thank to all of you participants for engaging. A big thanks to all the speakers who've set time aside to, to attend this event. And thank you. I would like also to thank the, yeah, let's give yourself a round of applause. For <laughs> I would also like to thank the team at La Tricoterie for their very warm welcome and hosting. It was a nice field, a place to 
we felt we felt at home somehow here. Thank you to Joyce van der Kaikova for, for helping us memorize what's going by and beyond. Thank you so much. It was a difficult task. You did it brilliantly, and we'll be able to view your your pictures online and on social media in the in the, over the next week. Thank you to Robin Denis, who's been following us these two days to make uh, beautiful pictures and a nice video that we'll be seeing. I'd like to thank the the team within uh, Resistory who's <laughs> who spent quite a few months and and sweat organizing this event, whether free by for the logistics, the content, the communication. So I'll be missing out on people, but I would really like to thank Alain, Vasya, Adam, Andrea, Federica, Claire, Agnieszka, Sophia, Maria, Aisha, Roberta, Marcella, and Sharula for putting things together. And I know I'm forgetting someone. Thank you. Mika was one of our advisory board members and we had the uh, another team, we had a whole team of advisory board members who would like to thank here uh, publicly for bringing really insightful expertise and we value that. Thank you to our national researchers who were really efficient in collecting the data, 800 narratives. They did a fantastic job and so we'd like to thank them. Some of them are here, we'd like to thank them. But also, a big thanks to Marina and Claudio, who coordinated the work of this, these national researchers. And always with a smile and lots of patience. I'd also like, I won't uh, cite the whole consortium, but I would like to thank, uh, specifically thank the, uh, the, the partners who weren't on scene over these two days. You've seen some of our, our partners here involved, but there were many others behind the scenes. Uh, in the shade who we haven't seen. I'd like to thank them explicitly. So Rana, Shara Fedin, Lorenzo Leonello, Igos, I'm sorry for the name, the pronunciation of the names, <laughs> Ziv Konik, Yvonne Gallison, Sarah Clevero, Clevero Laia Tarragona, Tina Carlson, Marlene Nistrom, Matilda, Lindmark, uh, Julia Adak, and Luke Margaret. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry about the pronunciation of the name. Many thanks to you all. I would also like to thank Anlo Humber, who along with Alain, Sophia, and Nildi wrote the proposal in crazy conditions, and were the first to believe that this project could actually take place and actually happen. So thank you to them. Thank you to the ISIS team who led the, the work package to, uh, on policy mapping and led to put hard work into the advocacy task. Thank you to Alain Denis and the Yellow Window team, whom we didn't say enough, made the magic happen between the first and the second day of the Open Studios. We made Open Studios seem like a wonderful tool, and they are. They seem easy. Well, more or less, <laughs> but it was a lot, <laughs> a lot of its success was due to their work between in processing the content. So thank you very much. Thank you to Sophia Spid, our very patient, brilliant <laughs> scientific coordinator. <laughs> she never gets annoyed when you ask her a random question. I mean, it's surprising. Thank you to Andrea Christina for the smooth management and yeah, for, for joining on board and so rapidly. And I'd also like to give a special round of applause to Adam Brandstetter. Where is he gone? Adam is hiding. Bring him in. So Adam has been behind the scene all the time. He's managed the consortium through difficult period throughout the project, constantly encouraging, supporting, and finding solutions at any problem thrown at him. So I'd like to, he wasn't on stage during these two days and I'd really like us to thank him. Here he comes. <laughs> thank you, Adam.
So thank you for, I haven't named everyone. I really like to thank all of you for your presence, for your active contribution. It's, we all think we're all gonna be sad uh, leaving this, uh, <laughs> at this place and uh, hope to cross your paths again and keep dreaming, keep pushing. <laughs> thank you. And last but not least, thank you Colette and Claire for all this communication. <laughs>